welcome to a new a new breed of golf live michael breed here excited to be able to help you play some good golf as you head into the weekend on a friday we had a great time on a new breed of golf on on sirius xm and and uh continue the the entertainment and the instruction as we head into this last week of the pga tour schedule um, before we get to what we're going to talk about today about ball first contact and the importance of it, let me remind you of the individuals that are a big part of the show. So without further ado, let me introduce you to Greg Ducharme and Steve Gibbs. Greg is the one over on the left-hand side and Gibbsy there running the board, making sure that all the camera angles are set up properly. So excited to be able to, to the, with the three of us working hard, be able to help you play a little bit better golf. Before we get to also, too, a couple of cool things. We're giving away today a pinned rangefinder, pinned golf rangefinder right here. Now, this is a really cool one. I've got the white one. You can see down below. There's six colors that are that are available for you. We're giving away one to one of you today. It's going to happen. One of you today is going to get a pinned golf rangefinder. Now, in order for you to be able to, to get that, you got to do a couple of things. You've got to follow pinned golf. Uh, on Instagram. So head over to, to Instagram. Make sure you follow them on your Instagram um, feed. Also, too, by the way, you have to comment. You got to get involved in the show. We want to hear from you. And you got to make sure that you subscribe to uh, my YouTube channel um, in order to do that. Now, that's for one lucky, lucky viewer here. But for all of you, we have a $30 discount for a pin rangefinder. And then you see those six colors there. You've got your choice. I've got the white one. Um, we also have a light blue one up here. My wife has one. So fantastic. They're, they're fan, they're, they're, they are incredibly accurate, but they're really cool. They got this one little thing, which is totally different. You don't have to worry about getting batteries or the battery running out. This is a charger. And when you plug this in, what you end up getting is 65 rounds. Well, 65 rounds, you're not going to run out of, out of, uh, it's that you're not going to be standing out on 12 T uh, on that par three that you play and you, you know, well, normally plays about 150, but the flags in the back, let me see what we got here. Oh yeah. Oh wait, it's not working. You don't have to worry about that. Come back in. You make sure you just charge this thing up. Simple to use. It also has a magnet so that you get, if you're on a cart, you just hook it to the magnet. I don't think I have anything around here to be able to do that with. Oh wait. Yeah, I do. I've got this one here. Look at this. It sticks right to your to your uh, club shaft, so you never lose it. You go, you maybe hit some shot into a green, you put it there, make sure it's next to the other club, you're fine. You don't have to worry about swinging within your pocket. So the pin range finder, fantastic work. I'm going to put it down over here. And really grateful for uh, the, the individuals involved with pin to be a part of the, the show and what we're doing going forward. Now, I want to talk to you about... Um, the the uh did i tell everybody that they can get 30 dollars off and all they yes. gotta do i gotta make sure you guys get 30 dollars and all, all the info is in the description as well yeah if, if you forgot anything so there you go 30 bucks use code breed to save 30 bucks they're 199 dollars and it is a fabulous fabulous range finder all right i want to talk to you now about ball first contact and and the importance of striking the golf ball before you hit the ground. A lot of people say hit the small ball before the big ball, which is something that we're working on here uh, in the coming week. We're going to have some really fun little golf uh, terms that that um, we're all familiar with. So we're going to be able to use that and, and share with you some of our favorites uh, as we go forward on, on a new breed of golf on Sirius XM. But ball first contact is something that we're all searching for. We struggle when we get into a fairway bunker. We struggle when we're hitting an approach shot into a green. Stand over a certain shot. You're not exactly sure what you're going to get out of, out of your six iron or your eight iron. You think, well, if I hit this solidly, it goes a certain distance, but I don't really hit it solidly all the time. And the next thing you know, you got a back hole location. You go, well, I'm going to take a little bit more club because I, I want to get, and then all of a sudden you get it solidly and it goes over the green and you make double bogey. Or you have a shot where you've got a, a, a front hole location and it's 175 and you hit your 175 club, but you don't hit it solidly. And now it comes up short and it plugs in the face of the bunker. Disaster happens. I want to talk to you how to create this ball first contact because ball first contact is what's going to give you ultimately confidence in these following things. So I'm going to hit one for you and then I'm going to walk you through some of the things. I've got a, a shot here that's about I think 175 yards to the to a back flag. 
So this may come up a little bit shy of the 175, but there's some predictability that I'm going to be uh, searching for here. So there's my strike. It's it's really solid, kind of at the flag, and then and like I said, I didn't want to get to the to uh, back to that back hole location. But I now want to talk to you about the predictability and the confidence in this. When you start talking about predictability, first of all, you're talking about the launch angle. That's one of the most important things. My launch angle, as I've said to you many times, is right around 100 and and uh, I mean it's right around 17 per, 17 degree launch angle. I might get an 18. It doesn't affect things very much. Also too, my apex, typically around 80 to 90 feet. I like to play at 90 feet. Sometimes it's coming out at 80, but that's a ballpark that I can judge. I also, by the way, have a ball speed and that ball speed is right about 114. I play it right around 114, 115. So when I'm hitting that shot to a back flag, I'm not going at it as hard as I can, but I'm making sure that it's getting back there. This shot got out to 171. So I'm about 12 feet under the hole there and a very easy putt to make. And I wasn't worried about the contact. So when I start talking about confidence, you start talking about predictability. That's apex, that's launch angles, that's ball speeds. Spin rates can be a big part of that as well. And obviously descent angle down here at 42 degrees, that gives you an idea of how much it's going to roll out. All that stuff is happening because I'm getting ball first contact. And so the question becomes, how do I create ball first contact? Well, one of the things that that um, creates inconsistent strike is where this club is bottoming out, okay? And people call it low point. Some people call it first touch. To me, I think I think first touch should always be the golf ball first. First touch to me is golf ball first. And then from there, you get low point, which happens after the golf ball. But the way I see it in the simplistic form is this. A, a club is either traveling down, along, or up. So every swing has down, along, and up. And in order for you to be able to strike the iron properly, what we want to be able to do is have the club traveling down. And when we travel down, now all of a sudden what we get is we get the golf ball first, then we get the ground, and then we get uh, the, the club coming out and, and the divot. Now, what I did beforehand was I recorded a couple of things to give you an idea of what the, the strike would look like in a normal, in a normal strike when I hit the ball first. So, um, this club is at address. I'm going to take it back, come into this, this strike. And what you could see is the club is off the ground right there. And then it strikes the golf ball. So it's off the ground there by, I, I don't even know, maybe it's, a, maybe it's a half an inch off the ground at three inches shy of the, of the golf ball. And then boom, it strikes it. And you can see the impact point is pretty low. And the ball is already starting to have a little bit of twist and a little bit of launch right there. And then you can see the low point happen right there. So let me erase this low point here. Let's go back one, two. Here's the, the, the golf ball itself, the back of the ball right there. So now I hit it. Now I get into low point, which is right here. And then you're going to start to see the mat kind of go there. So back to strike, low point, and then the brush. And it's pretty quiet over here where the ball was. And then all the action seems to be blurring right along here. And what that does is, is, it, it, it gives me the predictability that I'm searching for. All right. Now what I'm going to do is I've got, I've got a cool little worm cam that's set up here that we'll get back to in a little bit. But when you are thinking about this strike, the thing that I want you to imagine is the club is traveling down. The club head is traveling down. Okay, so image in your mind, you have down, you have up, and you have a long. So there's a line like this, a line like that, and a line like that. I want you to see the line going down. I want you to image in your mind that the head of the golf club is traveling down. Now, the way you teach yourself how to do this is what I have done is I built a little contraption out of PVC, as I always do. So I put that there like that. And then what I have is I have a clipboard from my fitting cart with Titleist. And what I do is I put that fitting cart right there. Now, 
gives you, yeah, beautiful. Now, what we do is, I'll, I'll do this without a golf ball first, is put the club, and let's not go close up just yet. Gibbsy, let's back out. Yeah. So I put the head of the golf club right where it says Titleist right there. And what you can see is the shaft of the golf club is leaning. What you will also um, come to find out is the trail elbow has bend in it. But right now the club shaft is leaning. When I start to move this club head down this ramp, and you can build a ramp however you want. I've done it this way. You can do it however you want, but you want to have a ramp. And what you want to do is you just want to glide the club down the ramp just like this. And a couple of things are going to happen when you glide that club down the ramp. The first one is the shaft is going to be leaning. The handle of the club is going to be ahead of the, the uh, head. So the handle ahead of the head and the club now brushing the ground right up here. So my brush point is right there. Okay. So that's the first thing that you're going to see. You're going to see the shaft having lean. If I were to... Uh, take lean out, I would do that. Nobody's doing that. You would never, I, I don't care who you're teaching or who you're trying to show your, your son or daughter. And you go, well, take this and run it down the ramp. They're not going to go like this. They're just not going to do that. They're going to go like that. The other thing that starts to happen too, is that when you go down the ramp, now all of a sudden the body starts to have a little turn in it. You're not just moving your arms like this. You're actually going to use your whole body to go like that. So that is a fabulous way of feeling what the shaft is going to be like when it gets to the, the strike of the golf ball. So that when we get into hitting the ball, we go, yeah, I want to make sure that that handle is ahead of the club head and the club head is moving down the ramp. So we'll be talking about down the ramp here for a little bit. Now, what I do is. And I'll, I'll do this one more time. Go, go ahead and get a, a five close up there. Yeah, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to slide this down the ramp. And you can see that my brush point is right there, which is where the golf ball is right now. Only this time what I'm going to do is I'm going to move it back just a half a ball. And that's going to ensure that I get the ball first. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down the ramp. And I'm going to hit the ball. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to record this so that you can see what happens. So let me go back over here, pull this up, hit record. And now what I'm gonna do, so we're gonna go down the ramp and strike that golf ball. Now the ball's not gonna go up into the air because I'm not moving very fast. It's also gonna hit the ball a little bit higher than we might normally. So what you can see, and when you go slowly, now you get an idea. I'm not compressing. I'm not pushing down on that, on that clipboard. And what you're seeing is the club now going down the, the ramp, traveling into the ball, still going down, still going down, still going down, still going down. It's off the ground right now. The shaft is leaning forward at, so a 70 degree, which is, means it's got 20 degrees of shaft lean. So we're working on a 70 off of a dead perpendicular, which would be that right there. So we've got a 20 degree shaft lean, high strike on the ball. Ball has a little bit of lift in it. You can see it has a little bit of lift and it also has a little bit of backspin. So here's this line there. And then when it goes now, it shifts that way. So you can see that I've created a backspin on the ball with the strike, even though it's high. It creates a backspin. And the reason why is the club is continuing to, to head down. So the ball is up in the air right now and spinning backwards. Let me show you this again. Here's this line. It goes up into the air, spins backwards. Now it's almost perpendicular to the ground, still up into the air. And my club is up into the, the ground way up there. I just think that's so cool, by the way. I mean, Greg, I know you're enjoying that. So cool. It's so cool. And so there's the club in the ground right there. And it's a wonderful, wonderful drill for you to understand what it feels like. And you're going to go, gosh, that feels so thin. Exactly. You're used to hitting it fat. You hit the ground before. So what this does is it teaches you to lean the shaft 
stay down. You're not going to early extend from here. You're going to stay down. Body is rotating. Club is into the ground right there. And now we're getting ball first contact. So you're going to start by building yourself a little ramp. Then you're going to do this other little drill. By the way, have I reminded you of the pinned golf range finder? We're giving away a free pinned golf range finder. All you have to do is three things. You got to comment, get involved with the show. The other thing you got to do is you got to follow pinned golf at Instagram and you have to subscribe to my YouTube channel, which you likely have done already. And if you haven't, please do it because we're excited to give away this, this range finder. And also too, we're giving, if, if you're in need of a range finder, no more batteries anymore, you're done. $30 off this pin golf range finder. You can get it for 200 bucks. So now I want to show you this drill. And this is, you know, uh, over the last few weeks, we've talked about how there are um, some drills that I'm not a big fan of. Greg and I are not big fans of. There's also um, some drills that we're big fans of. And this is one of those, those uh, drills. What we're doing is we set the club so that it's parallel to the ground. And in a down the line view here, Gibbsy, it's parallel to my toe line. So it's parallel to the toe line, parallel to the ground. And when that happens, what I now have is I have a bend in my trail elbow. You can't do, you're not going to do that. You have it right here. Hands are in the thigh. You're right there. And now the trail arm has bend in it. Okay. So now what we do is we take that position. We then rotate the body without leaving this bend, without removing that bend. We keep that bend in the trail arm. So we set, rotate, and then extend. And all you're doing is you're taking your bent trail arm and pushing down into the, into the ground or into the grip or into the uh, golf ball, however you want to say it. So here, here, there. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to record this drill and I'm going to show you how this strike, how this drill creates a downward strike. So let me go back here. Let me go over here and now I'm going to hit this and there. So we go like this. We go set, rotate, and then down. Now let's see what we get. So we're coming into the Body is moving forward. You can see the leg moving forward. Really cool to see that. Now I'm pausing. Now I'm driving down. Now look at how high that golf, the head of the club head is off of the ground. Next one, boom, golf ball, then into the ground right there. So ball was back here. So my low point moved an inch forward. And what's cool, by the way, is when you hit the ball, what it does is it throws the, it throws the head of the golf club into the mat. When you hit the ball, it chucks the, the club down. It's wild. And when you see it on really, really fast frame rates and shutter speeds, it's crazy how it throws it down. But that's how that drill is going to work for you. So you do this drill endlessly and you don't need to have a golf ball you can use if you want you can use a marshmallow you're not hitting it hard you can use a, a tennis ball i don't you do this inside it's a wonderful wonderful drill so here here and then here so we get over the ball here here there that was even that was really low i felt that one that one probably was on the second groove here here, there, stab it down. Now, you teach yourself when to extend the trail arm. We've talked about this before, the importance of the bend in the trail arm and when it actually extends. Well, it's going to extend after the strike and it's going to extend on the target side of the body. 
So we get in here like this. We make our swing. Body is rotating. That's the sequence, right? Sequence is the body's going to rotate and then the arm's going to extend. If the arm extends over here, body's not going to rotate. That's why that drill is so good. So we get in here. Arm is bent. Now we rotate and then we extend. I'm not going to hit this hard. I'm going to hit this well. So here and there. Now, pretty good strike. Doesn't carry the distance that I want. But come on up here and let's look at a couple of things that are important to see. When we start doing this, the thing that I'm really concerned with is the launch angle. Want that launch angle low. If we're, if we're releasing the club early, if we're bottoming out too soon, the launch angle is going to go up. That launch angle is 15. Remember when I hit my shot, it was 17.2. So that was a little bit lower. All right. And it doesn't matter, by the way, believe it or not, it doesn't matter about the speed of the club when it comes to a launch angle. So now let's get rid of that. Jump into this, record this, and now I'm going to make a swing. And I'm going to make this swing to get back to that flag. It's at 175. And I'm going to do the exact same thing that I've just done prior. So there's my strike. Now, come on up here and let's see where this strike happens on the club and the ball. So we're coming down, coming down, coming down. Here comes the club. Club is above the ground right here. There's the strike. Now the mat is... And I, you can barely see this, but that is just off of the ground. The head of the club is just off the ground. The impact point right there is the low on the face, which is exactly what I want. Now, watch what happens with the ripple of the mat. The low point's going to be somewhere around that lead foot. There it is. There's the low point, mat quiet. And then you get the brush point right there. Let me go back to where this brush point occurs. So strike. And then brush point right there pretty cool. Now come on up to the front here. Cause the front is going to be really fun. I know this is hard for you Gibbsy. So you got to take that four and shift it up there. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Well done. Now look at my launch angle right there. 14.7. So I'm right around that 15. Now, again, what I'm going to do when I'm, when I'm making this example for you to be able to see it is I'm going to make sure that I do what I want to do. I'm going to overdo it. I'm not going to underdo it because I don't want to hit it fat. So I make sure that I really hold on to that and then I extend, and that's why I get a low launch there. So I'm going to give you one more drill here, which is also one of my favorites and an easy one to do. And then we're going to get to some of your questions. Also, too, we're going to get a little update as to what's taking place at the Tour Championship. And they teed off at 11.45, so uh, there are a few players that are on the golf course right now. But the large majority is going to be sort of closer to, to uh, 1 o'clock Eastern. Okay, so now, same thing I'm doing right here. I'm going to hang on to that elbow bend, rotate the body, and make sure that we straighten it out on the target side of that body. And now, all of a sudden, that one's going to go in the water, Gibbsy. But come on up here and see what we got there. So I pulled that a little bit, no doubt. But what I got was I got that, launch, that low launch. So remember before I was at 17.2, as I said, that's at 15.9. Ball speed went to 116. That's above what I got before, likely because I hit a little bit of a pull. That one flew 177 in the air. So I missed that one to the left, but the distance was exactly what I wanted to. And typically what you're going to get if you shut that club face down, you'll pick up a little bit more distance. That one there picked up about two more yards of distance than I want. So a little bit of a, a little bit of a closed club face there, not quite the rotation that I want, but I still got the strike that I was looking for. I just pulled it a little bit. Okay. All right. So let me show you this last drill. And this is again, one of my favorites and it's really, and the reason why it's, it's one of my favorites, it's, it's easy. You just get yourself a shoelace. You're going to tie some, some knots in this. You slide a T through that. We're then going to slide another T through this one. Put this on the ground right here and right here. And then I'm going to put a golf ball in front of it. So there you go. That's the drill. And now 
what we're going to do is we're going to swing and I've got it about a club head in front. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to swing and make sure that I don't hit the shoelace that I hit the golf ball. So this is something that you'll do when you're getting ready to play. You don't want to take the clipboard. You don't want to take the PVC. What you want is you want something really simple and you just do it. It is a fantastic drill and something that, again, I recommend that you do all the time to just remind yourself of the importance of and what you have to do to strike the ball first. So now we get in here and all I'm doing is the same exact feel, same exact thing. That trail elbow is going to stay bent. Body's going to rotate. And now what I get is I get a, a, a very good strike. That ball starts on the line that I want. The launch angle there was 14. So again, a little bit lower, understandably, because I don't want to hit that, that uh, shoelace there. But I get that low launch, that piercing shot that I want. And the distance goes out to about 170. Very, very simple things for you to do. And what you notice when I do this is I'm not getting the 140 because I'm not hitting it fat. Hitting it fat, that's why people talk about thin to win. Thin is better than fat. When you get to where you're hitting this fat, you are going to lose a ton of distance, a ton of ball speed. That ball speed that I had right there, again, a little thin, 112, not a big swing for me. Now I'm going to give this a bigger swing. I'm going to try to hit this one out to that, to that flag at 175. So here we go. And that one's going to be just a little bit to the right. Has it got enough? Yep. And again, a 14 launch angle, maybe a little bit short. But still, that one's at 165. So I've got about a 20, eh, 30 foot putt. Here we go again. And this one again looks very similar to what I just did. Now I got to get one to get out there. I got to put a little bit more speed in there. So I'm going to take my drill away. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give this, this is, I'm on the golf course. I'm hitting a shot. So I've got my, my feel, my extension of the arm in here. Okay. Now here we go. Now here's my shot. Boy, I hit this one really solidly. Okay, so there you go. Got it all the way back to that 175. In fact, if you come up here, that shot was 175 to the, to the hole. That ball came out 174.8. Ball speed jumped up there to 117.4. But look at my launch angle, 16.1. So those drills have already had a difference it, for me. And as much as I do this, I was able to lower that launch angle from 17.2 to 16.1, which is one of the reasons why the apex is at 80 feet instead of 90 feet, and also why my ball speed picked up a little bit. You need to appreciate practice and the importance of practice, but also, too, what you need to practice, what you need to work on. These drills, very easy for you to do, and all you have to do is remember that. So that's why we leave this stuff up, stuff up here. You can go back and rewatch, but make sure you understand, that, and, I'll, and I'll just reiterate for you, the drill where you get set up, you put the, the club parallel to the ground and parallel to the toe line, trail elbow bent, rotate, snap. Here, rotate, snap, and low point gets up there. Then you also have that, that um, uh, shoelace. And then finally, where you start, build yourself that ramp. I use this clipboard. You can use any clipboard. And then all you're going to do is put this on here, don't press down on it, just drag it. And when you drag it, what you're going to get a feeling of is handle ahead of the club head, which is exactly what's going to happen when you keep that trail elbow bent, the, the handle will be ahead of the club head. When you start straightening out the elbow, that's when the, the club head starts to really release and kind of start moving a lot faster. And it's moving faster anyway th than the handle, but it moves a lot faster than the handle. And that's when all of a sudden it gets past it, okay? And then finally, the last part, maybe the most important part is the imagery. I want you seeing the club going downward, not along the ground and certainly not up or, or away from the ground. So it's downward. Every golf swing has downward, along and up. And what I want you to see to get ball first contact with an iron, I want downward. I want that thing moving downward. And that's the whole purpose of that drill with this club gliding along the, 
the clipboard there. Okay. All right. I know you all have some questions. I know you've had some comments. I'm going to throw it over to my friend, Greg Ducharme to give us a little update on what's happening on the PGA tour. And then also let's get to some comments, some questions. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of comments and questions. So great job. Everybody getting involved there. Uh, as Scotty Scheffler, Xander Shoffley are, are your top two, uh, Scheffler at 15 under after 65 yesterday, Xander at 10 under after 66 yesterday. Uh, and Joaquin Neiman and Matt Fitzpatrick had the rounds of the day yesterday. They're at nine and eight under respectively with 64s yesterday. Um, on the golf course now, we have Corey Connors. He's at two over. Playing long- in a single. Yep, playing as a single. He's yep. a long ways back. But one under on the day, Good. which is nice. Yep. Uh, Sahi Thigala is one over for the tournament, even on the day. Adam Scott is even through one. Victor Hovland, one under through three. So they're really just... Really just getting going out there um, this morning. Max Holmes, two under on the golf course. Nice. That's the low round out there now. Okay. All right. Now, here's our first question. Um, why do amateur players like us not start the downswing with the hips and instead the hands take over? Do you have any suggestions to correct that? Yeah. I, I, there's a couple of things that I think that happens to you. Um, first, what I really believe is, is that your intention and your target is the golf ball. It's an interesting thing. Like when you play tennis, you're trying to hit the ball. When you play baseball, you're trying to hit the ball. And the intention is to hit the ball. But the the real intention in the game of golf and the real target in this game is that thing out there, the flag or the fairway or start it at the tree or whatever. That's, that is... That's really what you're trying to do. And so what happens is, is that when you, when you start attempting to make that ball your target, what you do is you take the arms and hands and you throw everything down to there. Chuck it down to the ball so you go like this. And what happens is, is that the body doesn't, the body doesn't think about moving it over there. But here's the interesting part. If I hold this ball in my hand, Now, I don't worry about the ball itself. I don't have to worry about the contact. I have the contact. The contact is now with the ball in my hand. That's the contact. So now I can throw the ball to that target. And when I throw the ball to the target, now all of a sudden my body rotates and faces the target. And what, what, what tends to happen to us is we tend to think of the game of golf as I got to hit the ball. And what you do then is your body faces that target instead of facing that target. You get to where you're facing that target. Now your body's going to go that way and you'll and you will swing through the ball. And it would almost be as if there was a ball like lacrosse, the ball was attached to your club and you swung through and then flung the ball at the at the target that way. But I think the reason why you get to where and why amateurs tend to chuck the club and lose the power is of the target. The second thing is, and this is, this is um, something that we have spent a ton of time trying to help people do or not do is you think that you have to do something superhuman to get the ball, to get up into the air because you don't really quite understand the loft and how that will launch the ball up into the air and then how the spin will keep the ball up into the air. And so what you do is you tend to want to try to help it get up into the air. And that's when you start bottoming out too soon and trying to flick up. So I think it's a combination of you're trying to make that the target, understandably, instead of that the target, and you're trying to get the thing up into the air. And so that combination of up into the air and that target, you kind of fling back flick up. And as you flick up now, all of a sudden you start chucking that club as well. So a lot of bad things happen. And what I would tell you is remember the club will get the ball in the air. Don't worry about it. So long as the club is traveling down into that. And the second thing is make sure that your body is facing that target, not that target. So face target two, not target one. And I think when you combine those two together, what you're going to get is you're going to get a very effortless looking golf swing that will have a lot more power and a lot more distance than you have right now. Okay. All right. Uh, This is from Frank. I have a problem with ball only contact, not ball first contact. I tend to get the club back uh, to hit the 
big ball mostly with shorter irons and wedges especially i have a bad back and this is killing me okay so I, I, there's a couple of things that that um i would suggest first of all and again I, you have to understand i'm i look i i, I love this render. i i want to give you an opportunity to get a range finder is going to be great for you at a less cost but not to sell you anything and i don't want you to think i'm trying to sell you when this comes out of my mouth but i tell everybody all the time on the on the radio show go go talk to to uh par for success my friend chris finn in order for you to be able to to do what what you want to do with your golf swing you have to know if your body can do it and getting that self-assessment is just critical so what I would urge you to do is go get a, 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 an assessment of what your body can and can't do. Cause maybe uh, the pain that you have, the struggles that you're having in your back are making it very difficult for you to be able to do what you want to do with your golf swing. Now, having said all that, here's the easiest way that I tell people to make sure that they strike the ground as well. So ball then ground. And that has to do with what you're doing with your chest and obviously what you're doing with your, your trail elbow. Okay. So when I come into this shot, if my chest jumps up, the only way I can make up for that distance is to extend the arm. So I come into this, I jump up, extend, I'm going to hit it thin. And so what I like to tell people is you got to do a couple things. One, you got to feel like your chest is facing the ground. So when you come through here, you got to feel like your chest is pointing down. Imagine there was um, a, a, a car like a front light to a car it's coming out like this, right? You have that right here. I want you to take that light and point it right to the ground when you come through. So this light shooting out like this, and I want it to point to the ground like that. The only way it can point to the ground is if my chest is down to the ground. And so when I keep my chest down to the ground, now what I'm going to get is I'm going to get a ball, a, a contact from the golf ball, and then I'm going to get into the ground. And then the second thing that I want you to do is pay attention to this trail elbow. That trail elbow extends. Your body is going to extend. If I extend the arm, I'm going to extend the hips. I'm going to extend my, my chest and I'm going to stand up tall. And so what you want to do is you want to keep this bend in the elbow to keep this bend in the hips and the pelvis. So we go here to keep this so that I can stay down. So that combination, see if we can hit one here. Trail elbow bent through. Oh, that was a good solid strike there. Yeah, so this is going to be 173 yards right out there by that flag. And again, the fun part for me when, when showing you this stuff is I'm having a conversation with you, but I've done this so much that I know that I have predictability when I strike the ball first that the ball is going to travel about 115 miles an hour and it's going to go about 175 yards. That one there went out to 173. And so as I have awareness of what I'm doing with my body, arm, chest, whatever, I can now get predictability of ball strike, then ground strike, and then golf ball flying out to the distance that we want. So pay attention, Frank, to what you're doing with your chest and what you're doing with your trail arm, and you'll get the ball and you'll get the, the ground as well. Okay? All right. This is from TM. How many practice strokes do you take until you hit the bottom? Uh, this this comment was from a while ago. I think it had to do with uh, with the drill you were doing with the string um, hit, hitting the bottom of the ground. Uh, okay, so the, my I I'm a big fan of however many it takes. It's like it's like homework to me. When and I used to be the guy that I I would study for three hours and go, okay, I've studied for three hours. Well, the question is, do you know what you studied? How was what was your like? Do you know what, when you go, if you took a test right now, what would you get? So to me, what I learned as I got older was I don't care about the amount of time. What I care about is, do you know what you're supposed to know? So if I'm doing this drill and I can't get over that, that uh, shoelace, well, then I'm going to keep doing the drill and I'm going to do the drill until I can do it every day for 30, 60, 120 days in a row. Because I want to get so good that when I'm under pressure and there's a difference between hitting a ball on a range and hitting a ball on a golf course, and there's a difference between hitting a ball on a golf course and hitting a, a ball on a golf course under pressure. 
And what you need to be able to do is you need to be able to hit this golf ball on the golf course under pressure predictably. And when you can do that, now you can break thresholds. And thresholds might be breaking 80. Thresholds might be breaking 70. Thresholds might be winning a golf tournament or, you know, whatever it may be. You know your thresholds. But the point is, is that you have to be able to do this on a range, then on a golf course, then on a golf course in competition, and on a golf course in competition to win. And however many days it takes for you to do that is however long you have to do it for. But don't just say, hey, I did it three times in a row. I've, I've given so many lessons where people have gone, okay, they did it one time, and they go, okay, great, I'm ready to go. I'm like, so you got a whole one time in a row. Let's go. We can, now we can expect consistency. We got one in a row. Let's go for one in a row. No. I want a lot in a row. I want everyone in a row for an extended period of time to where you get a degree of predictability and you don't have to deal with doubt. And once you play golf without doubt, now you can play really good golf. Okay, Gregory. All right, Mike from Savannah. Uh, Michael, you're hitting off a mat in the studio, obviously. Um, do you pick it clean as opposed to taking a divot on grass? In other words, is contact somewhat steeper on grass than on a mat? No. And Mike, it's a great question. A lot of people say, well, if you hit off mat, you get a, you get a, uh, a result. Yes, you will. That will be better than if I was on grass. Absolutely. But if the result is only how far the ball went, then fine. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to record this because I want you to see this. I'm going to hit this one fat. Okay. Ball's going to be um, a pretty good distance, but I'm going to hit it fat. So here we go. Okay. So that was fat. Now I know it was fat. Watch what happens when it's fat. So there's my golf club right there in the ground and there's the golf ball right there. Now watch the the wave of the mat watch the wave right here there's the wave so the wave started back there and it goes to right there and low you know brush point moving on there let me show you let me go back one more now watch see the wave and i actually hit it back there that's where the wave started so i know i hit it fat now, if I go up to the front here, so just, just move camera four with me, Gibbers. Just move with me. There you go. Moving with me. Moving with me. Okay. Now, that one launched at 17.8. Ball speed went to 111. Well, those are kind of close. This one went 165. Hey, not terrible. Yeah, no, not terrible. But at the same time, I see that and I know exactly what happens. And what happens is, for me, when I'm hitting off a match, I can feel it. I can see it, but I can feel it. And so, and we've all had it. We've, we've all felt it. You've made that swing where you've hit the ball and it felt literally like butter. And you went, man, that felt tremendous. That's going to happen to you whether you're on mats or you're on grass. Because when I hit this one, I'm going to hit the ball first. And it's not going to matter that it's on mat or on grass because I'm hitting the ball first. The, the, if I could have been, I could have been on cement. I'm still hitting the ball first. So the ball's still going to have a very, very uh, similar reaction and certainly a similar ball speed. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit the ball first, do all my stuff in my mind. I've got that downward thing in my mind. I've got the elbow bend, body rotation. Now, come up to, to the front here, Gibbers. So... Now I look at these little, there's small differences, okay? Small difference. This is 17 degrees. That's what I launch it at. This is 174.3. I hit it about 175. This was 117 ball speed. I'm about 115, 117. This is 85 foot apex. I'm about 90 foot apex. So this one here, like this is what I look like. That's me right there. That's what my six iron looks like. In fact, my spin rate is typically between 5,200 and about 5,500. That one there is at 5,392. So these are, and by the way, the right, I like right. So this, this is me. That's my golf swing. 
And that would look like that if that was on grass or on, on artificial turf. It doesn't matter. And so what you do when you're on artificial turf is you get used to maybe record it. Maybe you've got a, a phone and you just put it down on the ground and record it. And you'll see where you're hitting. And then do this drill. And then all of a sudden record that. And then you see where that's being hit. And then you'll start to develop a feel of, yeah, I hit that ball first. No, I hit the mat first. And as that starts to happen, then you start becoming aware of what's going on in the bend in your arm, what's going on with your body, rotation, all that other stuff. And then you start having predictability and then you have some confidence. Go ahead. Okay. This is from Russell. Uh, actually, we have two questions on a similar topic, so I'm going to combine them. Okay. Um, Russell asks, how high is your ramp in the back? Maybe two inches. And then Fish Hunt Biker says, are the dimensions critical for the ramp in the back? Um. No, because they're, they're not critical because you're not hitting the golf ball with it. It's about, it's about two inches. It's about a two inch. So this ramp is about eh, maybe a little bit more, about two inches high. And this arm is about 14 inches. It's about a, uh, it's a 12 inch arm and then another two inches coming off of, of this right here. So this connection to this, this comes off of that. That's about 12 inches. This is a couple of inches. And then it goes in there like that. So it's about 14 inches. So I've got about a 14 inch arm. And from here to here is about a two inch, about two inches, maybe three from the very top of this to the very bottom of that. But that's not really, it, it's not critical. What's critical is that you get the feeling of the club moving down the ramp, which is going to give you the feeling that the handle is staying ahead of the, the club head. And that gives you a feeling of this. Because once you do this, once the handle stops and the head goes by it, now it locks the lead side of the body. It throws the lead wrist into a cupped position, and it stands the shaft up. So this shaft is this high like this, and when it's leaning, it's lower. So you can see where this finger is versus where these fingers are. This is lower. So once this starts moving that way, now all of a sudden what happens is you can see it's going low to high. So if I just take this and I just move this down here, it's low, high, 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 low, 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 low. So what happens is, is that when I take the club and I lean the, the club shaft, the handle is lower. And when I start flicking, now the handle starts getting higher. Okay. And so what that ramp does is it gives a feeling of the handle staying ahead, which gives a feeling of the handle being lower. And it also, if this handle is low, right, that club head is going to go up into the air. And now I can, now I can hit the ball first and then get the ground. Okay. This one from Emilio on a tee shot using an iron. Do you still need a descending blow on the swing? This is a terrible answer, Emilio, but this is just the way it is. Um, what's the shot that you're trying to hit? So what I, what I would say is 90% of the time, yes, but there's a 10% of the time where if I'm trying to hit a high draw, like let's say I'm, um, let's say what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my three iron and tee it up and I'm going to hit a high draw. I'm going to record this so that you guys can see this. This will be fun. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to move the ball position forward. So now when it's forward, now the club should be moving up. Same things are going to be true. So now I hit myself my high shot there. Oh no. It didn't catch it. Hold on a second. I hate when that happens. So now we got to do it again. You know, operator, look, this is the beauty of these live shows. Sometimes the operator makes a mistake. Let's try it again. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tee this thing up and hit a high draw. Okay, so I move the ball forward, which is going to mean the club is kind of moving up. I'm visualizing the ramp going up. And now I'm going to hit a little draw. So... So there's my high draw. Now, let's see how I did. All right. So let's rewind it. Here we go. 
Anticipate. Okay. So here's the club here. So that's going down. That's up marginally. So there you go. So that's up marginally. So if I'm drawing here, down, 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 up, 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 up. And so my low point is right about there. And so there are times, and by the way, that one launched, well, let's come on up to the front and just look at what we got there on that. So I was trying to hit a high draw. So remember I said, I play it about, I'm playing at about 90 feet. This one was at about a hundred feet. The ball started to the right. It curved to the left. It went about two, uh, about 215. It launched at 17.8. This is a three iron. My six iron launches at 17 to 18. Now my three iron, which how much, a uh, quick question here, Gregory, what's the loft differential between a six iron and a three iron? Nine degrees. Uh, it's probably good guess. It's probably a little bit, a little bit more than that. What would you say? 10 is six to five. It's probably degrees? closer to 12 because from six to five is four. Yeah. And from, from five to four is probably four. And then from four to three is probably three. So it's like 11 or 12. Yeah. But this one too is the, the U505. So it's a little stronger. So I think the loft on this is 18. And I think the loft on that six iron is probably right around uh, 30. We but I'm sure you could verify it. But the long and short of it is, is that with a three iron less loft, it shouldn't loft at the same, shouldn't launch at the same, uh, roughly the same launch angle as my six iron, but it does because I teed it up and I swung on, up on it. So Emilio, here's the thing. Terrible answer, but it changes depending upon the shot that, that uh, you're hitting. As a rule, what I would say is this, you're hitting your normal shot, you've teed the ball up. Yes, you're hitting down on it with the iron. Unless you're taking a long iron and you're trying to hit a high draw or something like that, then it might change. But 95% of the time, it's identical. Okay? All right. I'm still looking that up. Okay. This question, okay. um, here's another question from Jay Fredericks. Been fit for a putter, but have not purchased it yet. He said, I am, more, I am a more straight back putter and not an arc putter and suggested a mallet, which I've never used. What do you think? So um, here's what I would say. One, I, I, I'm, I, would, I would be stunned if they didn't let you try it. I would be stunned. Second, we did this study. When did we do this? A couple of months ago where we, we did the study on the number of mallet putters in play? Yeah. So it was a That's couple right. months ago, and we had an opposite field event as well. And we did the same study last year. And the number of, of mallet putters that were in play on the PGA Tour in this given week that we did this study was about 75%, which is just hard to imagine. But that's what it is. And I don't know what it is this week, but my guess is, well, I wouldn't say that. What I know is there's more mallet putters in play than there are blade putters in play. My guess is, is that that number is going to be roughly around 70%. I can't, I, I'm not certain we haven't done the test. We probably could, could do that roughly just going through the, through the, the T sheet and looking at the players and going, okay, well, Scotty doesn't use that, but uh, Justin does. And, and Colin does. What I would tell you is, is that the mallet putter is a real advantage and it doesn't have to do with anything of straight back or straight through. It has to do with um, how you're, how you're more consistent in your inconsistencies. You're going to get a better result out of the mallet putter than you are out of the blade putter. It's just that simple. So I would recommend at least try it. If they fit you for it and you're seeing a different ball roll, a better ball roll, then buy it. And by the way, when you buy it, if you've been fit for it, which you probably haven't been fit for a bunch of the other putters that are in your closet that you have, what you could do is you could sell those putters that are in your closet and pay for the putter that you're just, you're just buying. It would be that that advantageous for you okay all right Greg. all right so let's talk specs. let's talk specs uh in the 505u the yep. three iron 20 degrees so i was off i thought it was i thought it was uh i thought it was a little bit stronger than that okay so the we got four, 20 degrees the four iron if you're in the 505u again you're Should talking be about 20. 22 yeah so two degree difference only two okay. i thought it was three 
It typically is, yeah. Now, if you go to the um, six iron of the T100, the, so the six iron of the T1 is 30. So there's a 10 degree difference between those between those between two the clubs. three iron okay. and the six. So a 10 degree a 10 degree difference in that. Then what that does is there should, in theory, be a, a lower launch in that in that three iron. And obviously what you saw was it was 17, eight. My other one was like 17, two. So, right. Nice work. Very, very interesting. Nice work. Um, all right. This one's from Jono. Wait, do you want to give me a little update as to what's going on here before we get to, to Jono? Have we had anything different take place? Pretty the, much the, the same. Pretty much are not the same. Out. The leaders haven't gone off yet. Um, they're, they're still, they're still just getting going down okay. at the bottom. Did did I remind? Did I? I don't think I told everybody about our our blessed poker chip uh, ball markers. They're six dollars. It says Michael Breed has my name on it, has my logo on it, but it also has a new breed of golf on it. And I'm telling you, we had a cool email that came in from a guy who was playing with his dad, and his dad lost his uh, his poker chip ball marker. And meanwhile, he went out there, not the father, but the son, and he made a hole in one. I'm telling you, these things are blessed with good luck. So if you if you want one of these, they're six bucks. Send an email to me at a new breed of golf at michaelbreed.com. All right, let's go ahead back to that question. All right, jo this is from Jono. Okay, I always fight a pull draw, but ball the ball goes high and farther than my normal yardages. Do you have any exercises to help with that? Well, pull draw. Uh, there's a couple of things that I would I would suggest to get rid of a pull draw. One is ball position. So if I'm if I'm hitting pull draws, ball position is going to be up here. And what happens is because the club is working on an arc, by the time it gets to that golf ball, it, the club base will be a little bit more shut. And so what we would do is move the ball back in the stance. And when I move it back in the stance, now all of a sudden the club coming in from the inside um, as it would, but the because right here, the club face, and this would be good to do a split screen here, Gibbsy, if we have a, a, yeah, so right here, the club face is more open than it is right here. I can see much more of the club face right here than I can over here. And you can see when I go from here, it's going inside to back inside. So if I want to get rid of my pull draw, the simplest thing to do is to just move the ball back. And when I move the ball back, now what's going to happen is this ball is going to start out to the right. Let's see if I can hit a little draw here. Ball position is back. And now we go. And now what I get is I get a shot that goes out to the right. It turns over to the left. The ball speed is pretty well. That flew right exactly where I wanted. But because it's got draw spin, all of a sudden that ball's not going to stop when it gets onto the green. It's going to it's going to roll out. But that that landed at about 175. And so to get rid of the pull draw, what you got to do is you get get to get rid of the pull. See, we like the draw, but we don't like the pull. So to get rid of the pull, move the ball back in your stance, and all of a sudden that shot right there, well, you can show it up there, Gibbsy. Look at this thing right here. The horizontal launch, four degrees to the right. So four degrees to the right, that is French for um, I'm rid of my I'm rid of my draw. I'm rid of my, I'm sorry, I'm rid of my pull. Four degrees to the right, got the pull taken care of. How did, how'd you do it? Well, I just watched this guy who said, move the ball back. It worked like a charm, and it'll work like a charm, I promise. All right. What do you got? All right. This is from Dwayne. Uh, does smash factor measurements on a launch monitor give an accurate ball first strike measurement? Um, no, it doesn't. Because what can happen is, is that you can strike the ball first, but you can hit it in the toe or the heel and you can hit it in the toe or the heel. And that will take out some of the ball speed, which will alter the smash factor. So the answer is no. It's a nice question, though. Very nice. Okay, go ahead. Uh, this is from Tim. Which metric is better to pay attention to? I hit a very high ball because I'm generally vertical at impact. Um, which drill would be better? Again, that's from a while ago. So I think you're talking about the ramp and the strength. Yeah, and so to me, if I want to hit the ball lower, I, I want to make sure, and, and again, this goes back to that that dragging of the, the club head, but what also happens is, and I think Gibbsy, if you give me a five here and just close up in on the, on my trail wrist. So five close up. Yeah. You can see right there that my wrist is bent this way. Cause I've got the handle ahead of the club head. Once I let the head go past the club. Now, all of a sudden my wrist straightens out. So if I really want to bring trajectory down, 
and I don't want to do it with ball position, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on my wrist and making sure that my wrist maintains this little backward lean into it when we come into this. And now what I get is I get a ball that that one launched out at 12.2 at degrees and it launched out that low. You can see that vertical launch there, the third one down from the left, the vertical launch. And now all of a sudden, what I get is I get that ball down low because of that wrist position. So experiment with getting that wrist, wrist position to where it's really cupped. Be careful of making sure that you don't get it cupped and shut the face, but get it cupped and the face open, and then it'll square up nicely right there. Okay? All right, we got time for uh, a couple more questions here. So, um, okay, this one um, could be pretty quick. This is from Billy. Just curious, is this only for long irons or mid irons? What about wedges? I play a short golf course. It almost looks like a backyard, and I hit a lot of wedges. You know, we love Billy. Billy happens to be our producer on A New Breed of Golf. And when, when Billy sends in a question, what that tells you all is he decided not to play golf today, but rather – Stick around and watch a new breed of golf live. So, Billy, I appreciate that. Now, having said that, will you read that question to me again? Because I got taken with this is from Billy. And I'm like, I know I could look at your face and know you're laughing away and you're reading his his email. Okay. He said, uh, Greg, do you consider yourself an amateur player? No. Oh, that's the wrong <laughs> one. No, I turned pro in 2014. Yeah. Uh, just curious. Is this only for long irons or mid irons? What about wedges? It's it's th This is the way it is for everything. And what happens when you get a wedge? just so you understand. And it's a wedge, not a wedge. It's a wedge. You got to say it properly, but go down the line here, Gibbsy, if you would. So what happens is this, these handles are roughly at the same height, but this handle of this three iron is way farther away from the strike line than the pitching wedge. And what that means is, I'm sorry, the pitching wedge. And so what that means is, is that this is going to swing on a on a flatter uh, plane than the pitching wedge. And so what's going to happen is when you go to the wedge, it's going to be steeper. But you're still doing the same thing. Down the ramp, hit down on it. This is not going to, I don't even know what target is out there, but I'll hit it at the 175 one. And it's not going to get to 175. In fact, it's going to end up in the rough. But the point is that one there launched at about 23 degrees. And if I had that recorded, you would see a ball first strike. So it's it's the same idea. It's just it's different because you're standing uh, in a different relationship to the golf ball and how far away you are. So in a down the line view with a pitching wedge, I'm standing here. And with a three iron, I'm standing here just because of the length of the shaft. It's farther away from the from the strike line. OK, go ahead, Gregory. All right. This is from Alan. As I become a much better player, almost scratch, I sometimes go through stages of duck hook off the tee. Uh, I know you want to lead with rotation, but do you have any other helpful hints? Struggle with duck hook off the tee. Yep. Every once in a while, he goes through stages where he, he hits some duck hooks. Okay. So duck hooks are basically um, a, a lack of feel in your hands with where the face is okay now it can be a strike where you hit it out on the toe but i'm just going to assume that you're hitting it in the center of the club face okay so let's just make that one assumption so the duck hook is this ball that is struck with a very closed face and when that ball ball is struck with a very closed face so i'm going to take this club i'm going to close it dramatically and then I'm going to hit this shot. Okay. Now that is a duck hook. So come on over here and, and let's look at a, a little of the information that launched, even though that ball had 117 miles an hour of ball speed, because it launched at five degrees, because it was so shut, it only carried a hundred yards. Okay. It was going really fast, but it only carried hundred. Now look at what happened. My side spin here is higher by almost a thousand RPMs than the backspin. And normally my backspin with my six iron is about 5,000, 5,200. 
So if you add these two together, I'm at about 5,500. So I have a whole lot of spin. It's just in the wrong places. I got a whole lot of left spin. And then look at my horizontal launch, basically 11 degrees to the left. That's because I've got the club face shut. Now, when you struggle with a duck hook, your club face is shut. These are, again, always start with what you do before you put the club into motion. So many of you who have watched or listened to the programs that, that I have, what you'll know is I, I, I harp on what you do before you put the club in motion. I, I, that's what I just believe. Change or look at how you're holding the club. Maybe your left hand or your right hand has gotten a little bit too, too strong. Maybe they're rotated a little bit too far to the trail side, and now all of a sudden your club face is dead shut. So look at your grip first. The next thing that you look at when you're doing that is your address position. So in the address position, if I have my shoulders very level to the ground like this, then what I'm going to get is I'm going to get a steep angle of attack coming into this. And with a poor grip, I'm going to hit a, a duck hook. I'm going to hit a low whack, 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 ding, down to the left-hand side. So what you want to do is you want to feel like Okay, now I want to change my shoulder. So I want to make sure that my lead shoulder is above my trail shoulder. So now I'm up here like this. And then the final part is, and why people would hit duck hooks, and this is what will happen to me if I, and I don't really hit duck hooks, but I can hit some hooks. What happens is, is that the body stops rotating. And when the body stops rotating, the arms and hands have to take over. And now what I, what I do is I take what would be an open or square club face I stop my body so that shuts the face. And now what I do is I get a hook, sometimes a duck hook if I hit it out on the toe. And so what I would tell you is what you want to do is check your grip, check your posture, and then make sure that your body is continuing to rotate through the shot. And now all of a sudden what you're going to get is you're going to get a golf ball that's going to start a little to the right for the right-handed player. And it's going to curve a little to the right because I now have the grip and the face and the body doing what it's supposed to do. So the club face isn't slamming shut. Okay. All right. So Gibbsy, pull up that number eight. Cause we love, always love. Uh, you, you, you just don't know how hard this is to put together. A lot of, a lot of pre-programming planning goes on. Steve Gibbs works his tail off as does Greg Ducharme and, and all the things that we're doing and all the different avenues that, that, um, we're doing whether it's on CBS or on Sirius, whether Golf uh, uh, Golf Digest or Titleist or FootJoy, all of our partners. I, I I do it all with these two guys, and I couldn't get it done without them. So I hope you all recognize the effort that goes on um, with them as well. We couldn't do it without our partners, and I really appreciate Pin Golf being a part of the the show today and offering that that range finder for one lucky um, lucky viewer. Um, who, Greg, have you, have you chosen? Yeah. You want to announce it? Okay. Well, just in just a second. Okay. So, um, here's the deal in order for you to have been a part of this giveaway, what you have to do is you have to follow pinned, um, on Instagram at pinned golf. Also too, you, uh, want to make sure that you subscribe to my, my YouTube channel, which is right here. And we're trying to grow that. So, Please tell individuals what we're doing. What we're hoping to do in the future is be here with you with real regularity and helping you improve your game whenever it is that you're trying to do that. So we're trying to build that up. And with your help, we can we can do that. So make sure you subscribe to that and tell some friends as well. And then obviously we appreciate all the comments. Now, for all of you at any time, what you have to do, pull that back up again, Gibbsy, if you would. Um, the, those six range finders, we have a code, a special code with pin golf. You can get $30 off this, this range finder. It's a fabulous range finder. In fact, it's right here. No more batteries. You don't need any more batteries anymore. You just, you just plug this into your computer or to an outlet and it charges it last 65 rounds of golf. I, I'm sure there are some of you that aren't even playing 65 rounds of golf in a given year. 
And so this one charge lasts an entire year. You never have to worry about the batteries. There's no additional expense in the batteries, which many of the range finders have. You can just charge this thing up. And there are six different options there. So as I said, I've got the white one. You got plenty of different options, but they're $199. So with code breed, you save 30 bucks. Just go over to Pin Golf and you can order that up right away. We appreciate the involvement uh, that they've had in this show and look forward to doing a bunch of stuff with them as well. I hope everybody enjoys the Tour Championship. We look forward to talking with you on Monday on uh, a, a New Breed of Golf on Sirius XM. Also, too, we have a special show on CBS Sports Network uh, this Monday. It's going to be a, I'm telling you, it's going to be a great one. Um, CBS Sports Network at 7 p.m. Eastern. That's on Monday, so make sure you join us over there. But for all of us here uh, and what we're doing, I'm Michael Breed. Thank you so much for watching. I hope everybody has a great weekend. And we'll see you on Monday.